what was training like for you and, and where did it take place and for how long? Um, I, I didn't have any formal training, uh, when I was young. And, uh, I think I share a lot with a lot of these guys I came up through the theater. Um, so, uh, I started, I did my first play when I was um, 20. I was playing in bands before that. I really wanted to be a musician, but the music industry did not want that to happen. So it uh, didn't work out. And mm -hmm. then uh, theater became for me uh, kind of a segue. You know, it was still live and I was still performing, but I wasn't playing music. And so I did an awful lot of theater for a very long time in my 20s, just doing plays, the plays, the plays. And I think that for me was really where that was my education, you know, just learning on stage, watching great actors, doing kind of, you know, old plays and new plays and having to do it every night, having to do eight shows a week. That was really how I uh, how I learned, really. And I think, you know, I think every, all the lads will agree, like you're still learning, you're still figuring it out. Uh, uh, um, but for me, that was the most accelerated pace of, of, uh, education in, in definitely in this business that I had. Jeffrey, how about you? Yeah, I would echo, uh, that Killian. Um, I, I, my, I guess, you know, formal training began at, uh, at NYU in grad school, uh, where I stayed for about two months <laughs> and, uh, took off back to the theater. Uh, I'd done a play down in Washington, Lorraine Hansberry play called Le Blanc, uh, Zelda Fitchhandler, who ran arena stage, also ran Tish. She said, you should come up and get some, uh, some training. Uh, she gave me a full scholarship and I duly thanked her by leaving after two months. Uh, I was, you know, just out of school. That play was going to Boston. Uh, it had been written for the the role that I was playing. It had been written for the director, Hal Scott. He was also an educator. He had headed the program at Rutgers. But it was such a wonderful uh, role is how I got my equity card. I wanted to do it again. There was word that it might come to New York, to Lincoln Center. It didn't. But still, for me, it was the better way to learn, to kind of dig it out of the boards and, you know, kind of the old fashioned apprentice way. I learned, as Killian described, by working with actors who were uh, more experienced, who were wonderful theater actors and then film actors. Ben, it was really, you know, seven years of theater uh, until I got Angels in America, a film role here and there. But I just started acting very late. I started my junior year of college. So that was, you know, maybe uh, two years before I'd done that play in D.C. So I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I needed to figure it out because the driver for me always when I got on stage or got, you know, uh, in front of a camera, don't make a fool of yourself. So, uh, yeah, I had to, <laughs> I had to learn how not to do that. So it was, uh, it was just in the theater, um, working, uh, you know, as Killian described and, and, uh, finally in the middle of, uh, angels in America, you know, I said to myself, yeah, I think I'm an actor. That was after seven years, uh, of being in New York. Let me go back one to one point, though. My first job was children's theater in D.C. That was great training. Kids don't lie. I was doing American folk tales for elementary school kids in the D.C. area and Montgomery County. And uh, that's where it all began. People ask, how do you start? Start by finding a bit of work. Doesn't matter where it is. One thing will lead to another. Children's theater was the beginning for me. Children's theater in the morning, waiting tables at night, had cash in my pocket. In between, I would go to Pimlico Racetrack up in Baltimore uh, and see if I could stretch that <laughs> those funds. But also, I would study <laughs> the, <laughs> the motley characters around that place. Again, more training. So take it where you can. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Bradley, thanks to old clips of Inside the Actor Studio, we know where you got your training. Um, I'm so glad those exist of you standing up and asking people like Robert De Niro some questions. It sounds to me like that must have been very valuable for you, that entire experience. Yeah. I mean, um, God, I love hearing these stories. Yeah, I, I grew up in Philadelphia, like outside Philadelphia, and, uh, you know, nobody 
nobody did anything theater. You know, I think we did like, I went to like a dinner theater thing for one New Year's, like in Bucks County. But, but I just loved movies and television. That's basically was like my life as a kid. And it was like a party trick. A ask Bradley what he wants to do when he grows up. It was like, I'm going to be an actor. And everybody's like, <laughs> eh, idiot. And, uh, and, but like, but I, but I was at such stage fright. I was like so terrified. Um, I remember doing like a, 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 pl a like a presentation with those, those boards. And it was like flapping. I was so nervous. So the idea of doing anything, I just avoided till, college i did like i played like azalon who had like three lines in les mids and in uh in uh in valmont that play and i but i remember like i opened the door and got a laugh i was like oh this feels good and then i the only reason i got into the actor's studio which they had just started an mfa program because paul newman had stopped funding the actor's studio he couldn't do it anymore and james lipton had this idea let's align it with the new school and uh, and we'll air this tv series which is the thesis which is the thesis class and we can make revenue and pay for the actor's studio so they i i mean i that's the only reason i got in um i applied there rolling in missions and then it was like new york city man like that that was it i felt like i was I had just entered into utopia because Labyrinth Theater had just started. I was watching uh -huh. Phil Hoffman to Jesus Hop the A Train. Upright Citizens Brigade was just starting. That was Amy Poehler and Matt Besser and Matt Walsh. I mean, it was it was it was nuts. Uh, and then on top of that, those actors would come and do the thesis thing, which was just insane. But like Arthur Penn was one of my teachers, and um, Ellen Burstyn did a four week workshop. So it was really like, um, it was incredible. And I made friends there that I've kept for life. And I just never had a group of friends that liked talking about movies and theater as much as I did. Not theater. It wasn't to New York that theater really got me because the, 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 the program was a theater program. Um, and then I thought like, yeah, I'm just going to hopefully make a living as a theater actor the rest of my life. Uh, but I, like Jeffrey, I had no clue. Like I did, a, I did another play, um, Camino Real in college. And there's one scene when he's getting cuckold at the Tennessee Williams play. And I was like crying on stage. And I was so excited. I was like, I was fucking crying. <laughs> and then we got notes the next day. And I remember the director got to me and I was like, oh, she's going to really tell me I crushed it. And she was like, now, Bradley. So I liked it. You know, you were open. Um, but we're here to do the words of the play. And if you can't do the words of the play, because I realized I, I must have been, it must have been painful for the people because I did stop. I was just crying. I just like, <laughs> I stopped doing the words. <laughs> and so it was, uh, I was, I realized I have, I don't, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I, I actually learned everything in grad school, like a way to approach scene study, how to, you know, everything, getting in touch with myself, all of that. I had no clue. I just had a huge love for it. Wow. That's amazing. So maybe you're more lenient now when, as a director, when people don't go exactly off, off the, on the script, because you think back to, you know, what, what you did. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. Uh, maybe. Coleman, how, about, how about you? Uh, well, first of all, Bradley and I are both from the Philadelphia area. So I'm, I'm from West Philly and I grew up in a family where like the idea of being an, an actor and artist did, just didn't make sense in a way. It was like you, your job was to go to college and, you know, get a job with benefits somewhere and become a good citizen. But I um, I actually took an acting class as an elective in college. I was at Temple University studying journalism. And um, my mom was like, take something just for fun. Take something just for fun. And I was actually a pretty shy kid. And I was like, I think I want to take this and something that helps me get in tune with my feelings and all. So I took an acting class. And one day my teacher pulled me aside and he said, uh, have you ever thought about a career? Um, in acting, I was like, no, I don't, I don't know what that is. And I don't even know how, how that happens, how you get from here to theater or film or anything. So anyway, that stayed with me. He said he, he believed I had a gift. And, and so I quietly would take some, I uh, took a, two classes at the Walnut Street Theater School in Philadelphia, like quietly off campus, because I wanted to explore this. And I was, you know, doing these exercises, laying on the floor, filling myself up with orange juice and breathing and all that. And I was like, this is the best thing in the world. I just loved it so much. And so I started to, and then during circumstances, I sort of, I left college because I, I couldn't afford doing everything. I was doing everything in the world while I was also, you know, matriculating with classes. So I had a good buddy who moved to San Francisco. And he was like, hey, why don't you come out here for a while? Take a semester off. So I did. And then that lasted for 10 years. I actually moved to San Francisco and I started working in the theater. I started auditioning for things just 
I don't know. I just I wanted to make that a practice. And I started getting cast in things like, like, like Jeffrey, theater for young audiences. I was in the circus and then I would do Shakespeare festivals and every single opportunity. Like I had really no experience, but I used, uh, I would show up to rehearsals. I wasn't even called in for because I wanted to learn because it was all my conservatory. I was 21. I was skinny. I was active. So that's why I was like, Oh yeah, I'll, I had some skills. I'll, I'll learn circus things. So I became an aerial web artist. I did, you know, six feet tall stilts and juggling and teaching clowning. And I toured with a, a circus for a year and a half called Make a Circus um, in San Francisco. And then I also started getting cast in um, a lot of Shakespeare companies where I would show up to. I really would show up to every rehearsal because I wanted to figure out how to use language, you know, my voice, my body, you know, pitch my voice, all that's all that stuff I learned by by being cast and being willing, I guess. And so I think maybe that's always been sort of the way I've navigated this industry. I, I think I've, I've always believed that, well, if you teach me, I'll do it. But so literally at anything that I do, someone's always handing me a lute to play or a trombone. I don't play any of these things, but I'm willing. And I'm like, oh, let's figure it out. Or an accent, or here's your prosthetics, or here's a wig. Like I'll figure out how to do it. And I will, I will, I think I'm, I'm a, a bit fearless in that way because of my train, the way I was trained, because I really don't have any sort of way of doing it. I always have a new practice for each project and I've been liberated and that started early in my career. So I think that's been the way I've been navigating. And I finally, I still find that I, I always want to feel that way. Like I'm just about to do it and I can take risks and I can fail and I can try something again. Um, Cause that's, I don't know. That's the thing that I started out with. That's great. Paul, how about you? I sort of uh, fell into acting in college. A uh, similar thing. I, I sort of took an elective class and then I sort of got into it and I became obsessed with it. And I, I think I became a less than subpar student because all I did was sort of extracurricular theater. And in many ways, it was an extraordinary sort of training ground. I mean, it was college, but we were doing all of these kind of extraordinary plays. And I just loved doing it. And like I say, I didn't do much else. I, I kind of I kind of blew off classes and just did acting and got out of school. And I was a bit at loose ends and not sure what I wanted to do, even though this is a thing I loved to do. And I had a lot of friends from Seattle, from the Pacific Northwest, and I had a girlfriend. And it was as far in the continental United States as I could get from New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I'm from. So I went out there and I ended up wanting to do other things. I thought I'm going to go into academia. I'm going to be an animator. I was trying to do stuff like that, but I kept coming back to acting. And I worked in these, at that time, Seattle was a real place of ferment for all kinds of things going on. And there was tons of this crazy sort of experimental theater. So I started doing that. And I did a lot of experimental theater, which means I was naked a lot on stage. I was taking my clothes off a lot, to be completely frank, lots of nudity and lots of kind of crazy, weird experimental plays. And then I was sort of had friends who I, I came back to New York to do some stuff at La Mama and stuff like that. And I was sort of but I was just doing whatever the hell was coming my way. And you could get a lot of work then. There was a small pool of actors and there was tons of work in seattle it was the number one city in america so i was doing i ended up doing local tv commercials and industrial films for boeing the weirdest things possible i did an infomercial i did any crap that came my way because it was wonderful and exciting and fun and i learned film stuff on the job i just would get these bit parts and things and so i was figuring out how to do it just from being on the job which was a great way to do it it was scary but it was a great mm -hmm. way to do it um, and so I did, yes, as I say, a lot of this crazy experimental theater, we were going off and doing things in like bingo halls and stuff. I mean, like weird, I did stuff in all kinds of strange places. And then I figured maybe I should actually know what the hell I'm doing. And I, I went back to a drama school to sort of figure out what I was doing. And I went back to Yale and um, that was great. And again, just more theater and nothing but theater. And I got out and I did regional theater for a while is what I was doing. And then gradually, again, these sort of bit parts would come along and I would do stuff. I was at an event a couple of weeks ago um, in Palm Springs and several of you were there. And Jeffrey, you told a story on stage about an early experience that you had working with Sidney Poitier. Um, whether it's that story or another one, I would love to hear all five of you 
tell me a story about kind of a very important early experience you had on a set with someone who made an impact on you. So Jeffrey, I don't know if it's if for you, it's that story with Mr. Poitier or a different story, but I'd, I'd love to hear something that was very important to you very early on. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> so as not to repeat myself, I'll think of another. Um, I'll tell you, and it goes back to the training question. Um, talking about working with uh, other great actors, uh, if you have that opportunity. It wasn't a film set, was uh, the stage, Central Park, uh, doing a fellow in which I played the third Cypriot stone from the left. Uh, I was, um, yeah, I don't know, about 23, 24 years old. Um, Raul Julia played Othello, the late, wonderful, and Chris Walken played Iago. And <clears throat> there are a lot of ideas about how to play Shakespeare. Paul, earlier in one of our discussions, you said you weren't, uh, nobody sees you as a Shakespearean actor. I don't know why, if anybody's going to do it, it's you to put, uh, you know, that head to work. But um, there are a lot of uh, ideas about uh, the approach. Some of them, I think, are stale. The lesson for me um, in Shakespeare and in uh, being present and dynamic was taught by Chris Walken, Professor Walken, during that show. It was the most dynamic thing that I had ever seen live in my life. His facility with language, with uh, with Shakespeare, was just just unbelievably uh, uh, powerful. And what he did was so absent any false reverence for it or any concern about precedent. He took the language and made it his own, and it came out of his mouth as if it was freshly invented. It was the most incredible thing. I had. He's from Queens, and and Iago was at times from Queens. <laughs> it was just, but you'll not hear me. I mean, it was just the, and we were all of us, most of us, you know, in, in the, you know, in the company, younger, you know, folks, you know, some just out of school, some like me of that age, but you know, working our way. And uh, so this is the moment we would all stand at the bottom of the VOM, looking up at the stage every night in the Delacorte. There are these two VOMs that exit downstage to um, a space under the audience where the dressing rooms are. And, but you can gather down there and you can watch the show. And we're down there early on in the run and we're watching the show and we're all standing like, you know, just a gang of us standing, just mesmerized by what we're seeing. Until after a few shows, finally, Chris came down backstage to the stage manager. He's what these idiots standing down, <laughs> down there. Come on, get them. And he said, get him out of there. And we had to. We had to, we had to put that in the rearview mirror and we never stood down there again. Uh, we were distracting <laughs> to, to Professor Walken. Uh, take from that lesson what you will, but uh, yeah, it was a potent one for me, one I'll never forget. At least you got to have that experience until he kicked you out. Um, not to make anybody follow that, but Coleman, follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll follow with it. It's funny, the moment you said that, it made me, you made me think of something that wasn't even on stage or in, in, on a set. You actually made me think of a panel that I was on when I was about, I would say, 25 years old. Most The first 10 years of my career started in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's where I went there to become an actor and I turned into a writer and a director and producer. I had my own theater company, et cetera. And so I'm this young, I was on an artistic director track. To be honest. Most of my even colleagues in San Francisco, they run theaters now. That was totally my path. Um, but I was on this panel with Joy Carlin. She is a fantastic actress who's been based in the Bay Area for a long time. And I was on this panel with this senior, you know, she used to, she was the interim director for Berkeley Rep at the time. And we we're sitting on this panel and, and she's uh, some, some kid uh, stands up and is like, oh, um, 
do you have any advice for me? I've taken this class, I've taken this class, I've done this, I'm doing this since I was 12 years old, et cetera, et cetera. And she was talking, and then I'm going to go to this school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, and I'm looking at her, she says, that's great. You've had a lot of training to do what you're doing. The thing that you're going to need more than anything to sustain yourself in this industry is to be curious, to be curious about art and sciences and humanities and politics, to move somewhere, to fall in love, to fall out of love, to have your heart broken. You need to be a real life living human being. And I sat there and I looked because I thought, you know, it was all about the art for me and creating, creating, crafting. And it shook me to the core. It changed the way I thought about anything. I thought, you know, any, anyone who says, oh, I'm so focused on my career, I can't have a relationship. I'm like, that, after that, that was never me. I was like, I need all of it to live. I need to be curious and in the world. And it really, it really shifted something in me of how do we create what we create and the why underneath it. So it was Joy Carlin. I, mean, I remember she, 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 she really inspired that for me to actually be even more curious about it and everything that things that have nothing to do with creating art and theater, but it has everything to do with it at the same time. So wow. that was, that was profound for me. And you remember it all these years later. So obviously it was impactful. I, rem I remember that. And I remember this, cause this is something I always tell students. I remember also during that time, I have a lot of people, Rodessa Jones, this wonderful barrier um, performer who used to also work uh, in the prison system. She said one day, she said at the end of um, a talk back, she said, um, I'm going to leave you with this. And I always leave this with students. She said, politics doesn't work. Religion is too eclectic. But art, art just might be the parachute that saves us all. That was so profound. This is what I was, I was receiving as like 25 years old. And so I feel like these things, it, they, I, of course, stays with me. I carry that to remind myself what's important about how do we create art? You know, why, why do we do what we're doing? Why do we reinvestigate that stuff over and over again? Because it's about the human connection. So I've been, I feel very blessed that my career started in a place like San Francisco where I could just really be a very liberated artist. It wasn't about getting New York Times reviews. It was not about moving anywhere. It's about like actually just being a fundamental artist and creating work. That's great. Killian, how about you? An early experience that sticks out in your mind? Um, well, I remember there was a couple of things. I remember you know, being a young actor and just touring around Ireland in, in, in theater. And I was so happy. I was so excited to be actually making work, to be actually employed. I, like I was a college dropout. And like I said, the music hadn't worked out. And, and we were just playing, you know, little theaters all around the country and doing kind of old plays. But I remember once working with this older actor and it was very, very early on. And I can't remember, was it, it would have been like a, probably not very many people in the theater, you know, we'd come off stage and uh, I remember whatever I was doing with my costume, he was like, he stopped me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, son, always hang up your costume. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that is, and that's a practical piece, piece of advice, but it's also a sort of philosophical piece of advice because what he's saying is just because you've been out there and just because you think you're great and just because you're under the lights and you know you said your lines you got a round of applause and all that you know there's all these other people involved mm. in this endeavor from the stage manager to the the, the lighting guy to the, the mm. bus driver to everyone else who's working on this piece and you were just a cog in it and always remember that i always remembered it and 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 like it's you know what I mean. It's not just the actual act of hanging up your costume and bringing it back to the costume department. It's the it's the the understanding that this is a collective act that we engage in. And then I was very early lucky early on as well that I worked with a lot of um, actors, a generation ahead of me, Irish actors that you'll all know, like Brendan Gleeson and Stephen Ray and Liam Neeson and these guys. When I worked with them very early on, they were so kind to me and gave mm -hmm. me so much time. Uh, even when I would have a, like a, like a one line on some Irish film and they were the lead, but they would take the time and I would ask them questions and, uh, you know, ask them advice and they would always give it to me. And like, I remember Brendan Gleeson in particular, I did five films with him in a row kind of when I was young and there were small parts, but he, you know, he would take, he would give me a lift home with his driver because I lived close by. He didn't need to do that. He didn't want some kid in the back of the car with him, but he always did. And, I always remember that kindness because I looked up to those guys so much, but they always took the the time, you know? Mm. So that's two little bits for you. Mm. 
Paul? Yeah, I think I had a similar sort of thing to Killian in that regard, because I think of uh, very early on, I did a movie with Stanley Tucci and um, he was terrific. And I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, like I say, I'd done these sort of bitty things on film, but I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I had a pretty good part and I had a lot to do with him. And it was his kindness and his sort of attention. And he was so... I think I didn't know what the hell to do on film either, but here was this guy who was like, no, 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 it's the same serious approach. It's not bullshit. We're going to work on the lines. We're going to improvise stuff together. We'll hang out together. We'll work on stuff. It was incredibly eye-opening and wonderful. And I can remember him doing things like, come here, come here, come here. Come look at yourself on the monitor for a minute. I said, I want to watch. He said, no, you, you're going to have to get okay at watching yourself. You got to watch yourself a bit. He said, I also want you to see how good you are. And that wow. was just incredibly like mm. touching to me. And he was just really caring and so precise and such a great, great actor. And just, it was wonderful and really made me feel special and made me feel looked after. There's one other thing I do uh, that I think of all the time. And this is about 20 some odd years ago. And it's not quite the same thing we're talking about, but I think about this all the time. I, it was, it was the Tony awards. I was on a, I was in a play on Broadway and they'd asked me to present an award that night. And so I went there and I was hanging out backstage, all the people, and I was sort of getting ready to go out and do my bit. And in the corner of the sort of green room back there, Judy Dench was sitting and she had to present an award. And she was obsessively going over her lines that she had to say to present the award. She was nervous as hell. And she was working on her lines to do the presentation of a Tony Award. And I caught her eye and she looked at me and she said, I'm just so nervous. I just have to work on this. And I thought, there you go. Like, yeah. doesn't matter what it is. She was working hard on just the most ridiculous thing. It was That's beautiful. Great. So when you mentioned Stanley Tucci, is that the Walter Winchell Yes, that's right. It was a movie about Walter Winchell. Yeah. Right. Terrific. Uh, Bradley, same question to you. Yeah. And Paul, we haven't seen each other, but Paul and I worked each with each other on Hangover 2. That was my next question, because I because Coleman and Jeffrey have worked together as well. But but I also oh, want to hear anyway, your really memories of the Hangover 2. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, the minute you the second you said it, I knew exactly what the moment was. I, I got a huge break. I'd, I'd been like a, a, a like the nice guy, like asking the girl, like, you know, how was your trip? And she's really a spy working like two hours of five days a week living in L.A. Wanted to kill myself on a TV show. And then everybody's like, oh, he's such a nice guy. And then David Dobkin gave me a huge break by casting me as the bad guy in Wedding Crashers. And um, and I remember that was just Chris Walken was in there, Jeffrey. Yeah. And it was just like watching him. I, I, I used to go down and watch everybody work. I never, I never, every day I would just go down and watch everybody, but it was Vince Vaughn. I'll, I'll never forget it. I think up to that point, I always just try to get it right and be, be present and get it right. And I'm watching this guy destroy a scene, like just crush it. And then he wants another one. And then just, like just be so I remember it was the scene where um, uh, the grandmother shooting him uh, the, takes the gun out and he's running out and he's just like, David, I want to do another one. And, and in front of everybody that, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the, this huge crew and lights. It's so nerve wracking. And just his willingness to fail watching Vince Vaughn, this huge six foot four golden glove champion, tough guy, funniest guy, quickest guy. Like you're just like I was just sort of in awe of this human, this man just failing, like mm -hmm. just willing to just try anything. At some point he was like scatting to Gloria. And I was like, he just like caught on to this thing and he was doing this song. You know, I just love singing, but like clearly it wasn't really working, but it didn't, it didn't even matter. Like it didn't even become about the movie. It became about all of us watching this artist just explore with complete abandon. And I remember it was like, it was like a, a diamond through the middle of my head watching going like, that's it. Mm -hmm. Like that freedom to just be absolutely willing to fail. Uh, just, it changed me forever. And it was like, yeah, that was, that was the moment. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have good memories of working together on hangover part two? 
<laughs> I, we, were, we were very excited that Paul Giamatti was coming. And I remember I remember the scene we had in the, in the up in that high uh, hotel. That's what I remember. We were on yeah. a rooftop in a hotel, this gigantic casino hotel in Bangkok, and there were no guardrails on the roof. No, no, it was very <laughs> literally, scary. Literally, you could just dive 90 stories down to the streets yeah. of Bangkok. That's what I remember. But we had I remember <laughs> Paul screaming at me. Yep. He was very angry, that character. <laughs> very <laughs> terrifying. Angry. Yes, indeed. Angry. We had a good time. It was a lot that of was fun. Well, and then on the total other side of the coin, Jeffrey and Coleman, you guys are obviously both in Ruston. But had you had you gotten to know each other through the years before that? Not no? really. No, yeah. not one bit. I just, yeah. I just I just followed Jeffrey around and watching him be brilliant. <laughs> I did. I just always admired him. And so when I heard that he was going to join us for that, I was like, oh, I, I couldn't have been more excited. I think, listen, I was excited about the whole cast. But Jeffrey, when you came and I was like, I've, I've been wanting to be in the same air as you for a long time. And I love that we spar in a beautiful way together. That was a that was a it, it wasn't the top floor of a hotel in Bangkok. It wasn't that, there wasn't that much air in that room. It was a, no. a lot of people right. cramped in that room. It was tight. It was, <laughs> it was uh, smoky, uh, a bit steamy even at the same time. Uh, and there was a wonderful focused energy in there. The group of actors around that table, Glenn Turman and, uh, and Andre McDonald. And uh, I mean, everyone and these young people kind of gathered around who really kind of served as an audience in some ways. Did you sense that Coleman? You know, oh, they were, they, they, because you know, they, they, they were there. A lot of these young actors at the beginning of their career. And then you have people like Jeffrey and me and Michael Potts and, and, and all these other people around the table. Right. So it was, it was like, and then George C. Wolf, our fantastic director, really guiding us to really just making it, making it combustible. And, you know, we don't know. He's like, you know, you're doing your, you know what the scene should be, but then, what I loved about Jeffrey, you come in, you don't know exactly how it's that dance. You you work, you work. I think we all do this. I think everyone the Zoom, you prepare, you prepare, you know, you research and everything, and then you're so open and available. And so I I credit whatever I did in that scene with what Jeffrey was giving me. I did not navigate that, and I love that surprise. I don't I don't I don't try to figure out. Oh, this is the way the scene should play. I'm like, oh, this is he's taking the air out of me. That's when I see when I saw him, but he sucked the air out of me when he starts talking about Pasadena. And and because and also it's just something the way you play, which is beautiful. I feel like it's a beautiful dance that we did. Well there was there was just you know wonderful villainy to play with there. Uh, <laughs> I mean and that's who he is ultimately. It's I mean true, he, which is so you know, great. He just dips in and out, but he's the villain to the, you know, to the heroism of, of you know, this this man. And he comes at him uh, at all his vulnerabilities. It's pretty, pretty dirty, grimy, you know, oily political stuff. And that's pretty lovely stuff to play with if you're playing that type of character. <laughs> But yeah, and of course, George leading, you know, George is everything to me. You know, I've uh, you've worked with him many times, haven't you? Yeah. Many times, many times, uh, beginning with yeah, Angel. Of course. Um, but I'll tell you a story uh, about working on this piece, on how, how I came to work with this piece. I've known of Adam Clayton Powell for many, for as long as I could remember. Of course, he's the first uh, uh, Black elected congressman in the history of the United States. The other, there were others uh, during Reconstruction, but they were appointed in the South. He was elected in 1941. He, uh, from the district in Harlem, and he... You know, has a, a career that extends into the early 70s, uh, some bumps in the road later, but uh, extremely charismatic, extremely effective and highly regarded in, in, in the black community, particularly of that era. And in my house, uh, uh, you know, having grown up in D.C., my mother, a lawyer, uh, you know, very politically aware house and Adam Clayton Powell had a big presence there. Uh, so my mom passed away about a little over oh, a couple of years. So a couple of years before we worked on on the film and I was down in D.C. taking care of some affairs at her. House. A cousin of mine had gone down because he had to do some work in the basement and pulled out uh, books and uh, and her uh, and albums and, and, and things and brought them up to the living room. 
so that this work could be done. So I go down there and I couldn't find a place in my schedule to do the film uh, because I was doing Westworld. I'd gone away to do uh, 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 work with Wes Anderson for a bit. So I wasn't sure they were going to let me off. But anyway, I'm down in D.C., had a little bit of a, a, a gap to get down there. I walk into my house. I open the door. The first thing that I see in the living room staring at me is Adam Clayton Powell's face with his finger pointing at me like this on the album, uh, on the cover of an album of speeches uh, by him called Keep the Faith, Baby. It was my mother's album. Mm-hmm. I called George. I said, you, George, you have no idea what just happened when I walked. He said, Yes, Jeffrey, that's your mother telling you to do my movie. And so <laughs> and so I said, I said, OK, George, I am in. that's how I got there. But that's what I tried to bring to is just this understanding of him as a presence for, you know, for since as long as I could remember. So in some ways I had been rehearsing, uh, you know, his character for a while. And he was part political showman, part political shaman. But uh, but uh, um, yeah, that was a good. Of, of, and, of and, it was, and it was it was wonderful and it was wonderful working with you on it, Jeff. Yeah, wonderful with you with you as well, Coleman. Uh, yeah. Although I had to, you know, I had to be pretty grizzly that day. Yeah. Good. Uh, Sissy Spacek not wanting to play Loretta Lynn, and she gets in her mother in law's car, turns the radio on, and Loretta Lynn starts playing on the station. She's like, "It's a sign. I'm going to do the part." Um, with the couple minutes I have, I have left. You know, in talking to actors for the last thirty years of my life. It's such a rewarding career, potentially, but it also is a line of work where oftentimes you don't have the most control over your own career, particularly early on. I'd just be curious to to know how the five of you have kind of navigated that um, facet of things, because you know, people always say, how do you choose your roles? Well, early on in your career, you're not choosing roles. You're taking what work you can you can get. So I don't know, Killian, if you if you think back first, how how has that journey been for you? And, and how did you deal with that in maybe an earlier time where maybe you didn't feel like you had 100 percent control over the way your career was going? Yeah, I think we've we, we, we've all been through that at, at different points. It's 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 you kind of have to be ready for that. I think when you set out to do it, um, you know, most of us were a lot younger then, so we kind of have the confidence of youth, and you're you're able to take knocks and all of that. But I, I what's always worked for me is 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 for me. I just followed the writing or the work. It, the the medium was secondary. Do do you know what I mean? So I would go off and do a play for eighteen months, and then get a few bits on telly, maybe, or and then get a little part in a movie. So I was just I just wanted to work. I had no mission statement or manifesto or plan or anything. I just, I just wanted to work. And so I was so happy to be working, but at the same time I was reading all of the time. Do you know what I mean? Reading, reading, reading plays and and watching movies. And I think if you do that, uh, you can kind of educate yourself, but in terms of taking the knocks, I think you just got to keep on picking yourself up. You know, that that's, that's what you've, what you've always, what I've always done. And you, I've always felt you get the parts you're meant to get. And then the other sort of truism is that, you know, work begets work. So the more you work, the more other people see your work, you know, uh, it really helps. Relationships really help. I think in the business, if, you know, you, you work well with people, you establish good rapport, uh, then it can build collaborations. And one of the things that's worked out for me is that I've recollaborated many, many times with many, many different people. And I think that comes from just uh, getting on with people and kind of being respectful and being kind. Um, but yeah, I mean, for all the young actors out there, it is it is a tough ride. It is a tough ride, but stick with it. That's what I feel. And do every single medium. Don't turn your nose about anyone. Hmm. Anyone else have anything to add to that? I'd like to pick up on that just to, since there are a bunch of students out here as well. And I, I love what Killian said. I think the way that I've stayed in it and navigated this industry for a very long time is by by the thing that I always tell students when I teach. No one can tell you not to create. No one can tell you not to create. Build from where you are. I started out as an actor, but because I was frustrated with some of the roles that I was auditioning for, again, this is the 90s where what was available to me was much more limited, I think, in terms of complex roles. So I would write and I would create work. 
And then because I had, I had curiosity about many things, I would direct work and I would produce work. And this is when I was in my early 20s. I don't know where this comes from, but I believe, and I'll build relationships. I always tell students to get that nasty word out of your mouth, networking. You don't want to network. You want to build relationships. You want to really yeah. get to know people. You want to build, you want to build relationships and coalitions with theaters, with, with uh, producers, with editors, you name it. Because this is your, and start with your community, community to be small. And dedicate yourself to the work. And yes, there's going to be highs and lows. You're going to bartend. You're going to teach. You're going to take a full-time job. You'll fall out of it for a couple of years. Your parents will die. They'll live. I don't know. But you're going to go on this wave. And you ride that wave for as long as you feel like you have purpose and intention. And there's something there for you. It's okay if you step off sometimes. And it's okay. But trust that as your, your guiding force. But, but find ways to feel like you have agency in this industry. And so for me, I've been navigating that. Let's say that... I would always believe, and I still believe this, no one can give me anything that I'm not giving myself. No one can give me anything that I'm not giving myself. I can build it myself, it can be small audiences, you name it, or these other wonderful things come along that's just um, icing on the cake, but you can do it you, and, and trust that and, and build partnerships and friendships and really invest in it. I love that. Bradley, how, how about you on that? Same question. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I never had a plan or like, you know, what's your five year plan or where do you see yourself in 10 years? I was always like, huh? Like, I don't I don't I don't I don't, I don't think like that. Um, I love the idea of like picking up a, a mug on stage and, and, and there's no water in it. And I believe there's water in it. Like the thrill of like accomplishing that like gave me a lot of happiness. <laughs> so like, I, I just, I loved it so much. And I think it's that love. And I, I talking to, we've all been able to talk to young people. It's like, you know, how much do you love this? You know, because that is, that is your battery pack. That's going to offset all of the strife that comes. And, uh, and the other thing is it doesn't ever end. I feel like it's all the, the, the pieces change. I find this business just as hard as it was when I was uh, putting myself on tape for Pearl Harbor, you know, you know, when like I was reading the other lines and timing it out, you know, on the VHS tape to send to Bonnie Timmerman, who was never going to see it anyway, you know, because I read saw him backstage because they legally had to do that, you know, even though Ben Affleck was already cast. <laughs> Actually, no, I was fascinating. And like, you know, I just thank God I've been blessed with uh, curiosity. I just can't get enough of it. And that, that is what I think is going to be able to keep you going. Paul, you're nodding. This is, oh, that's this is really good. important. That's because I think that the, it's all, it's all good work, whatever you get. I mean, you know, I was doing really scrappy little things, but it's exactly that. There was an incredible joy in meeting all these people and learning about what all this stuff was and excitement and joy, whatever you can mine out of it. Yes. It's going to go in the hopper and be something useful to do. There's something though that, uh, that's interesting that I do want to say. It's a little bit, but I was just, I, I, I was talking to somebody the other day about auditioning. And it's a lot of what most of the work you're doing is auditioning. That's the job of an actor. So much of it for so long. And I do. And people said, you know, how, how did you, how did you take it? How could you do it? And I think it's important to look at that as this opportunity for joy mm -hmm. and learning and curiosity. I always walked into the room saying, I have no idea what people think I'm going to, no idea what they're going to do, no idea what they're looking for. So I'm going to do whatever the hell I feel like doing in this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have a great time doing whatever the hell it is. And just, and so that each time, every one of those things wasn't this menacing threat mm -hmm. hanging over my head. It was an opportunity to have a great time and to have a good time and do whatever the hell. And if they wanted to work with me or if they didn't want to ever see me again, that was fine. But I had done this thing and I, so I kept maintaining my connection to acting, keeping my imagination alive, keeping my voice alive as an actor, keeping my dignity up as an actor. And just, so I know that that's something else too, that I think can be helpful when you're. And then Jeffrey, just to finish, I mean, I remember interviewing you 28 years ago for Basquiat. I mean, you were already like, you know, turning so many people's heads. What has the ride been like for these three decades since? Long, strange trips but all good. <laughs> Long, strange <laughs> trip, maybe. Um, you know, if you're uh, looking for consistency and control, uh, predictability, then this is not the line of work for that. Um, 
uh, there are many things that are completely out of our hands. The one thing, and I think this uh, centers on on what we've all said, the one thing that we can control is who we are and the work that we do. Um, that's, you know, that's our oyster knife. It is what, how we work, the quality of our work. Um, and that's it. Uh, there was a woman that I worked with. This goes back to an earlier question. Lilia Scala on that first play that I did, she had been nominated for an Academy Award opposite Sidney Poitier in Lilies of the Field, I think 1963. She was Austrian, the first or well, of the first certified architects in Austria. She had escaped uh, the Nazis and, and wound up here at some point an actor. She was playing in uh, this older, well, of course she was older. She was born, I think, in 1896. She's about 91 when I worked with her. She was playing this uh, matriarch, this missionary, uh, in this kind of mythical African country. I was this young boy. Anyway, at one point we were in rehearsal and she was tough as soccer, football leather. I mean, she was just like, uh, I would see her jogging to work in the morning at 91 years old in the snow, dead of winter in Boston to the Huntington Theater. Anyway, one day we're in a rehearsal. There's a pause. She's sitting on my knees next to her. And out of the blue, she says to me, she says, Jeffrey, she said, you know, you're good. She said, you can make it. But success will not, not drop out of the sky like a ripe apple. You must work. Zoom. Like, you know, diamond in the forehead. It meant not just work uh, to be seen, but work to grow, to build something that you do have the capacity to control. All of the things, Coleman, for example, that you described in terms, in Paul, in terms of reading and killing, reading, knowing, having interest, curiosity, bringing all that to the table, but channeling, channeling it through your instrument. That's what you can control. That's what I took from that, from her. What I found over time, for example, the first time I met Wes Anderson, sit down and talk about doing French dispatch. He said, you know, I've seen pretty much everything you've done on stage in New York. And I was like, what? Um, yeah, uh, you didn't come back and say hello, but I was, I was, I was completely caught surprised. He'd seen the work and ideally the quality of the work and it appealed to him and he wanted, you know, to work with me now. He had written this book for me, one of the most beautiful pieces of writing that I had ever received. It's all it's what I could control, even without you know, support necessarily from the powers that be from, you know, from the studios and the executives and all of that stuff that's out of our hands. But through my work, I was gaining even unknown to me tacit support at times from fellow artists. And that's really all that I needed. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, that was all that I could at least indirectly control through, you know, through, as Lilia said, through work. Uh, just, so. to, just to tap on to what uh, Jeffrey's saying is, uh, I was really uh, looking forward to this today in a huge way. And I, and it's community. That's the other thing. It's just like community. Be reminded that like, wow, there, there is a community. Um, and that that's also what I think is, is essential. And Coleman was speaking to that, you know, may, find that group of people um, but even just in this setting to, to, you know, if you told me when I was like taking Leonardo DiCaprio to his room <laughs> as a doorman that, that I'm going to be sitting here. I mean, it's just fucking mind blowing. And we all have those stories, but just be here today with you, seeing all these beautiful faces, the community of that, that fills me up. That's going to keep me, that's going to, that's going to have mileage. I love it. What a pleasure to be with all five of you. Paul Domingo, 